Yeah, you're on. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Richard Dean Winfield, and I'll, I'll say a word before Professor Chomsky joins us. Uh, I have spent the last 40 years primarily as a philosopher and a philosophy professor. I had been motivated by an interest in politics early on, but I felt uncertain about the nature of justice and where we should go. And ultimately came to the conclusion that I had to appeal to reason, had to appeal to philosophical investigation to determine what was it that true conduct should be and engaged in a, a long running investigation of these matters, which led me to understand that uh, self-determination was really the center point of what valid conduct consisted in that ethics truly consisted in thinking through the reality of freedom. And that required thinking through what are the proper structures of political freedom, social freedom, family freedom, moral freedom, and, and property relations. And at a certain point, I felt that the time had come to leave the academy behind. And armed with a certain degree of philosophical certainty, attempt to deal with what I think is the real crisis of American democracy, which came to a head with the election of Donald Trump in 2016 as a, and has been accelerating through his first term and with all of the world global crises of a pandemic, of an economic crisis, of an advancing climate catastrophe, and the persistence of, of racial and, and gender injustice. All of these matters have been putting into question the continuation of our democracy as it is, as well as the question of how we can perfect it. Now, I launched a campaign two years ago to run for the US House of Representatives in my local 10th Georgia congressional district. And the focal point of my campaign was to advance something that had been put on the political agenda back in 1944 by Franklin Delano Roosevelt and which had then been reiterated by Martin Luther King and his Poor People's Campaign. And that was the idea that our, our constitution is fundamentally incomplete. It ignores the family and social rights without which we can't have freedom fully developed at home or in society. And that the blockages of opportunity that operate both in society and home are such as to prevent us from really participating as equals in self-government. So I put forward a, uh, what I call the job guarantee social rights agenda, anchored in the idea of a federal job guarantee to wipe out unemployment and poverty income, and consisting of a series of proposals that in a nutshell would enable all of us to have access to the various factors we need in order to exercise our freedom independently of how much wealth and income we have. Now, I still consider that to be a, a, a challenge that has to be met if our democracy is really to be <clears throat> properly in place. Uh, it also includes a right to a healthy environment, and that puts us in face of a global crisis of advancing climate heating that may put not only at risk our democracy, but all of our institutions in question if we fail to take decisive action and allow all sorts of uh, feedback mechanisms to put us at a point of no return in terms of maintaining a, a biosphere that is truly inhabitable. Now, I consider that the, the threats to our democracy consist on the one hand in our failure to fulfill the social rights agenda, uh, but there are also problems regarding the very structure of our government. And in addition, there, of course, is a mounting threat in our nation and in pretty much every other developed nation, a mounting threat of what could be considered uh, a renewal of fascism, that is, of a anti-democratic nationalism, which I think is fundamentally fueled by the economic insecurity and anxiety that has led many in the most affluent nations to feel worried about their livelihood, in particular feel worried about unemployment. 
And that has allowed certain anti-democratic populists to villainize the influx of immigrants and minorities as perpetrators of the economic insecurity that is facing many people, even in those nations which have had social democratic governments that have provided health care for all, that have provided uh, free college education and so forth. But I see that uh, Professor Chomsky has joined us. Yes. So let me Sorry, turn the discussion over. Um, hello, hello, Professor Chomsky. Thanks for for joining us, and thanks for everyone, everyone for being patient. Um, uh, sound a little okay. Right. Um, so I just wanted to introduce myself. I'll be uh, moderating this event. Um, my name is Ramin. Um, I'm an undergraduate student uh, uh, studying philosophy at the uh, at University of Georgia. Um, and I just let me just uh, very quickly in introduce the uh, our panelists or our guest speakers. Um, uh, Professor Noam Chomsky is a um, world-renowned political dissident, linguist, and author. Um, he is a laureate professor in the Department of Linguistics at the University of Arizona and a professor emeritus at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, um, where, he, where he had taught for more than 50 years. Um, Richard Winfield is a philosophy professor and union member who has taught at the University of Georgia for nearly four decades and published 22 books addressing knowledge, nature, mind, ethics, and aesthetics. Um, he is currently running for the United States Senate in Georgia special election, uh, calling for a social bill of rights, um, a bold platform that aims to remove the obstacles to opportunity uh, that shackle our democracy. Um, so basically how this event is going to go is um, uh, Professor Chomsky and Richard are going to um, exchange ideas, have a have conversation. Um, and at the end of this, near the end of this event, if anyone's interested in asking questions, they can uh, either comment on the uh, Facebook live stream or they can um, say it in the, in the Zoom chat. Um, so yes, without further ado, um, uh, Professor Winfield, do you want to ask um, Professor Chomsky a question? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> Professor Chomsky, thank you for, for attending this event. And uh, I was briefly describing how I was promoting an agenda of a social bill of rights anchored in a federal job guarantee as something that would help uh, perfect our democracy and remove the blockages of opportunity in society that also obstruct our political freedom. And I was wondering what you consider to be the agenda that we need to follow to redeem our democracy and secure its proper continuance. Well, there's a series of steps and degree of urgency and uh, timing. Now, the first one is coming up in a couple of weeks. If uh, President Trump is either reelected or refuses to leave office, as he said he will do if not elected, then all guesses are over. I mean, it's going to be very hard to preserve any form of uh, democracy. As you probably saw, uh, two highly respected, high-level military officers, General John Nagel, very well known and respected, another top military officer, that just wrote an open letter to the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Milley, uh, reviewing for him his constitutional responsibilities. If the president loses the election, refuses to leave office, uh, surrounds himself with paramilitaries, uh, armed militias, and they said it's his duty to send in the army, the 82nd Airborne, uh, to forcefully remove him. Nothing like this has happened in 350 years of parliamentary democracy. We're facing a totally new situation. So I guess what might happen. This is the kind of thing that happens in 
tin pot dictatorships in some neo colony where there's a military coup every two years. Uh, Trump has reduced us to that. It's interesting. And the whole Republican Party is going along with him. Not a peep. Uh, he's made it clear that he wants to ram through the Supreme Court nomination in order to ensure that he'll have the votes on the court if it ever comes to that. Okay, nothing like this in parliamentary democracies. Just the last step of a series, most recent step, not the last, I'm sure, of a series of actions to try to undermine the possibilities of a functioning democracy. Could run through others, but this is the current one. So that's problem number one. Well, if we can somehow get over that hurdle, then there comes a fundamental problem. Uh, just to briefly review in a couple of words, since the Second World War, uh, there have been essentially two phases of the American social political system. In fact, it's worldwide, but here specifically. First period, end of the Second World, World War into the late 70s, period that's called regimented capitalism. Uh, the highest growth rate in American history, it's called egalitarian growth, lower quintile did as well as the upper quintile, the New Deal measures remained. Uh, banks were banks, no explosion of financial institutions, no crises, uh, no tax havens, no, no shell companies that was all blocked by law and the laws were enforced. Uh, uh, income, wages attract uh, productivity, uh, as you might expect, uh, so on. That's the first period. Changes, the late 70s, dramatically in 1980, we enter the new period of neoliberalism. Its essence was announced right away by Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, the two leaders, just take Reagan's inocular address. Government is the problem. Uh, we have to move decisions from the hands of government, which is to some extent under popular influence, uh, move them into the hands of private power, which is totally unaccountable and which is dedicated in principle solely to self-enrichment. That was announced at the same time by Milton Friedman, the economic guru of the neoliberal age. Well, that's what's happened. Uh, wages haven't tracked productivity, they've stagnated. The real male wages for non-supervisory workers are actually lower than in 1979. Uh, income is massively concentrated in a very few hands. The financial institutions have just blown up. They pretty much dominate the economy. Uh, crisis after crisis, uh, the constant bailouts, each one worse than the last. Uh, Rand Corporation just came out with an estimate of the income that has been removed, or we might say robbed, from the lower 90% of the population the working class, the middle class, as a result of these policies, uh, they estimate $47 trillion. That's in addition to the tens of trillions of dollars that have been moved to tax havens, shell companies after Reagan under neoliberal principles eliminated all the rules, and it goes on from there. So the first thing we have to do if we want to, of course, that has an overwhelming effect on a function of democracy. It means that if somebody is elected, say, to the House of Representatives, the uh, first thing he has to do is get on the phone, uh, make sure that the donors will fund him uh, for the next election. Spends hours a day making sure that the funds come in. Uh, meanwhile, hordes of lobbyists, which didn't exist before, but have grown enormously in this period, uh, they descend on congressional offices meet with the staff, basically write the, elect the uh, legislation, the representative signs it, a little bit of an exaggeration, but not very much. 
uh, end result is that about 70% of the population is literally unrepresented and that their own representatives uh, don't adhere to their uh, policy preferences and wishes. Okay, that's been pretty well established. Well, that's a thumbnail sketch. Goes much worse when you look into it in detail. So the second task is somehow to reverse all of that. Now that's an imminent problem. The pandemic is raging. There's a question, what kind of world will emerge from it? Uh, there are basically two major forces contending. One is those who created this system, benefited from it enormously. They want to ensure that it persists even in a harsher, uh, more form, more surveillance, more control. Uh, they're working relentlessly as we, as we talk. There's other forces, popular forces that want a very different world. And the question is, what will the outcome be? Well, if we can reverse this regression of the last 40 years, then we come to your, the question you raise. How do we move forward towards an authentic social democracy? Well, there's some immediate steps that can be taken, which don't sound very dramatic. Uh, for example, we can join the rest of the world in normal policies that are taken for granted elsewhere. So it takes, say, healthcare. Uh, the United States is practically the only country that doesn't have some form of universal healthcare. So we can join, that's an extraordinarily costly, highly inefficient, uh, very harmful to the population. You can see that in all sorts of ways. Uh, the Lancet, the leading uh, international medical journal in England a couple months ago had a study estimating the cost of the uh, privatized healthcare system in the United States. Rough estimate is about 70,000 deaths a year, uh, about uh, uh, 500 billion in expenses. That's serious, uh, not small money, not small costs. So we can join the rest of the world in uh, having a universal healthcare system. But we can join the rest of the world, a lot part of it, in having free higher education. Uh, that's pretty common in most places. The rich countries that are, do the best on the international testing, like Finland, Germany, others, and the poor countries like Mexico, right near us, many others. So we could rise to that. Well, it's interesting that these are the two major programs that Bernie Sanders has been putting forward. Now, they're described constantly as maybe good, but too radical for the American public, meaning it's too radical for us to rise to the level of most other countries. That can't be the case, certainly not. So yes, we could overcome the ideological, cultural, uh, political uh, barrier, economic barriers that prevent us from at least joining the rest of the world. Now we can go on from there. We should be the leaders. I mean, take education, for example. Now, mass public education was one of the great contributions of American democracy uh, to, the, to the world from the late 19th century, followed much later by Europe and others. Now it's being chipped away. In the neoliberal period, it's been cut away piece by piece, defunding public schools, defunding state colleges, uh, ensuring that uh, in imposing business models, which mean hiring uh, adjuncts and graduate students because they're cheaper. Uh, the Secretary of Education has quite openly said she thinks we ought to basically get rid of the public school system our great contribution to democracy. That doesn't have to be tolerated. And we can go on with many other programs. But I think there's a series of actions that have to be taken. None of them easy, but they could create a far better world. I haven't even mentioned the most important. I'll just mention it and not go into it. If we don't introduce some form of a Green New Deal Everything else is moot because there won't be anything to discuss. 
one of the parts of the Green New Deal that uh, Bernie Sanders finally um, began speaking about in this most recent presidential campaign was the idea of having guaranteed jobs at fair wages. In other words, of instead of regarding unemployment as either something inevitable or as having some kind of optimal size to keep inflation in check, we regard you know, the right to work in the true sense as a fundamental right. And I, I think that is really a key measure to both reversing the disempowerment of labor since the period you, you, you spoke of, which came to an end, let's say around 1970 or so, <clears throat> and also to halt the accelerating uh, increase in wages and, and wealth inequality. Uh, because in a sense, if we, if we really have a federal job guarantee, making a permanent fixture of a just society, what FDR introduced on a smaller scale as an emergency measure with the WPA and the like, you know, we, we can in effect put employees in the strongest position with the tightest of labor markets, you know, remove the pervasive fear of firing that allows all sorts of misconduct in, in workplaces <clears throat> and uh, not only put uh, a halt to what is often called the school to prison pipeline and, and mass incarceration and recidivism, um, but putting people to work who can deal with all those public goods and services we're not attending to, in, including a, a new green infrastructure. And if we attach it to not a living wage of $15 an hour, but a fair wage, which really would have to start at at least 20 and have it keep pace with not only inflation, but the growing prosperity of the nation, you know, we can begin to keep a cap on the uh, decrease in the share of wages in the national income, which is at its lowest level ever. And I think you would also agree that we need to properly empower labor, whose decline sort of follows through sort of in tandem uh, the, the increase in, in, in inequality in wealth and income. And I'm proposing two measures. One is that we have automatic union elections at all workplaces with multiple employees, since the Wagner Act procedures have proven to not be workable. And that we also do something that I, I think might fit with some ideas you've expressed in the past, the idea of having employee co-determination, where we transform corporations from within and require, as is done in some European countries, the board of directors to have 50% of, of, its, seat, 50 of its seats allocated to employ representatives who could from within have a fair share in governance and really change the whole be behavior of, of corporations. Quite agree, in fact, should have mentioned that, but the neoliberal age began both in Reagan's America and Thatcher's England with uh, sig significant attacks on the labor movement. First thing that Reagan did, first thing that Thatcher did was move to destroy unionized labor. Major strike breaking. Reagan even authorized uh, scabs, uh, replacement workers, illegal in all the world outside of apartheid South Africa. Other cor corporations then picked it up and went on, increased under Clinton, same in England. And there's an effect. Uh, the Economic Policy Institute, Major Research Institute, has been putting out study after study, showing convincingly that the decline in unionization is the major factor in rising inequality. Now, this has just recently been endorsed by Larry Summers, former Treasury Secretary, you know, major figure in the really in the neoliberal system. That's not just a recent paper saying, yes, it seems that you can trace the radical growth in inequality to the decline in power of labor to defend themselves. That's a fundamental neoliberal principle, notice, to destroy unions. It's not accidental. You go back in the history of neoliberalism, begins in the 1920s, uh, interwar Vienna, Austrian economics, the guru of the movement, the patron saint, 
uh, Ludwig von Mises, could barely contain his joy when the proto-fascist government violently smashed the labor unions and destroyed the Austrian social democracy. And there was a principle. Labor unions interfere with what's called sound economics. Why? Because they defend workers' rights. You shouldn't do that. That interferes with sound economics. Uh, safety and health measures interferes with sound economics. Got to eliminate that. In fact, von Mises at the same time, 1927, uh, wrote his major work, Liberty, in which, he, which was basically, a lot of it was an ode to fascism. That fascism will go down in history as saving civilization. Uh, it's, the, it's the greatest development of the 20th century. This was repeated in, uh, when the same group had a chance to take control of the government. Pinochet's Chile, violent, vicious dictatorship, labor destroyed, all the Chicago boys poured in, Friedrich Hayek, great neoliberals, they could impose sound economics. 1980, they started imposing it on the world. So there's nothing, nothing, nothing novel about that, implicit in the principles. And we should remember that as we move to a new world. Uh, you mentioned the minimum wage, exactly correct. Uh, the minimum wage tracked productivity until the neoliberal period. Late 70s, it breaks. It's flat, meaning declining because of in inflation. If the minimum wage had continued to track productivity, it would now be over $20 an hour. That's a, that should be a floor. About unemployment, we should bear in mind that the mission of the Federal Reserve is dual. Control inflation, maintain employment. They concentrate on one, not the other, but that's not a law of nature. Uh, the Democratic Party during the regimented capitalism period they used to be in favor of uh, full employment. And the last gasp of that was in 1978, the Humphrey Hawkins bill called for full employment. Now, Carter didn't veto it, but he watered it down so that it was toothless, voluntary. Last step in the betrayal of the working class by the Democratic Party. Uh, one of the reasons why the working people who voted for Obama, switched over to Trump. At least maybe he can pretend to be for them. Yeah. Democrats don't even pretend. Okay, that's- uh, I mean, I, I think the, the failure to opt for the right to work and, and require full employment has, has been a problem afflicting many social democratic political movements in Europe because they haven't adopted uh, full employment as, as an actual guaranteed right. And I think that has led in nations such as Sweden, or, or Norway, or Holland, which have all of the um, programs you were, you were speaking about, universal health care, free higher education, very um, beneficent unemployment benefits, but they haven't opted for guaranteed jobs. And as a result, I think that leaves the door open to anti-democratic forces. Um, I'll, I, think it's, yeah. I would like to interject just for a second, just so we can get a few audience uh, questions in. Um, so, so Chloe Parker, um, she's asking that uh, um, I'd like to know how how you all feel um, about the current police brutality um, in the United States and how that's affecting our democracy. Um, Richard, I guess you could you could answer first, and then we can go to know. Um, well, well, the level of police violence in the United States is unparalleled in any democratic nation. It's, it's far beyond what occurs anywhere else. Um, and as we know, the victims are disproportionately African-American. Quarter of the victims are African-American. Our police kill about 1,100 people each year. And uh, since 2005, there've been about 15,000 people killed by police in the United States. And only 44 of these cases have actually resulted in any kind of conviction of police. 
So they are basically getting away with murder. Uh, they certainly do not need any kind of qualified immunity. That, that's completely ludicrous. So there's a, there's a complete lack of accountability and transparency. Um, and, I, and I think obviously we have to remedy that. Uh, and we have to recognize that local uh, prosecutors and the like are very much having a vested interest to cooperate with the police who work hand in hand with them. So I think we really need independent investigations of every, every incidence of, of police violence. Um, but I think it also reflects the fact that uh, the police essentially are there to put the lid on a dysfunctional society, a society that is, is uh, tolerating mass poverty and unemployment, tolerating a failure to deliver mental health care to people. And all of these things obviously have a racial aspect since there is disproportionate poverty and lack of services for people of color and also women. And the police are those in immediate contact with all of this. And insofar as they're there to maintain the law and order as it is, those who are suffering from these indignities are their victims. And uh, you know, if we, if we talk about the slogan of defund the police, what's really required is something that goes well beyond the budgets of any police department or any municipality. It's a matter of providing genuine public safety by eliminating poverty, eliminating joblessness, providing health care to all, including mental health care, providing housing, eliminate homelessness and the like. And I think that's really what the real solutions will have to involve. And another side of it is that, you know, we do not provide people any guarantee of legal representation in civil cases. If you want to defend yourself against police brutality and sue police for misconduct, you don't have the resources unless you have plenty of money. So we need to have legal care for all that will extend free legal services, not only in criminal, but in civil cases. And I think that's another part of the, of the equation in, in being able to contain uh, this kind of misconduct. And, and Professor, Professor Trump, your, your thoughts on, on police brutality and how it's affecting our, our democracy? Yes. Well, I mean, I agree with everything that Richard just said. The fundamental problem is the social conditions and inequities which turn the police force into a control, uh, a control force uh, to keep the poor, uh, black, uh, deprived populations under control. That's a fundamental problem. And, and all of the measures that he described are correct. We have to do those. There are others. So one, one issue is just kind of technical. The defund the police call, one crucial part of it, which I think the police are in favor of, is remove police, take away from the police the responsibility to do things that they're not equipped to do. So a very large part of police work is things that should simply be done by community service. Uh, police don't have to solve domestic disputes, uh, don't have to deal with mental health patients, uh, don't have to deal with uh, uh, homeless people. You know, a great deal of police work really belongs with community services. So if police are defunded in the sense of keeping taking all those resp those responsibilities away from them, we'll already have made a big advance. Another move is what uh, Bernie Sanders and Sachs suggested. Police ought to be better paid, better trained, and so on. A third point, which is fundamental, is a disease of the society uh, that is the gun culture. It's insane. There's no society in which People walk around with assault rifles. Uh, there's a, in which, if you ask people today, uh, what's in the Constitution? The first thing they'll say is Second Amendment. It should be understood that that is a public relations scam. It was invented, the gun culture was invented by the gun manufacturers in the late 19th century as the first 
major, huge propaganda campaign of the public relations and advertising industry. Uh, after the Second World, uh, the Civil War, uh, there was a racket, radical decline in market for gun sales. The government didn't want them. European, European wars were declining. How are they going to sell these fancy guns? It was an agricultural society. Every farmer had a, a musket, say, to scare off a coyote or something. But they didn't want the fancy stuff that the gun manufacturers were producing. They therefore created an image of the Wild West, which never existed. You know, the sheriff fast on the draw, you know, uh, uh, Buffalo Bill, the whole nonsense, all concocted. It sold. When I was a kid, I believed it. Other people believe it. The bottom line is you better buy your son a Winchester. He won't be a real man. Uh, this all expands into a culture in which massive supply of guns everywhere. Uh, it was all intensified radically in 2008 when the Supreme Court's Heller decision reversed a hundred years of precedent and turned gun rights into a holy writ. A very dishonest decision, I should say, could go into it. But all of this has created a gun culture with just massive killing going on all the time. Now that affects the police. When they move to direct police work, they have to expect that they're running into an armed population. That doesn't happen in other countries. Uh, it's one factor that, fundamental factor that has to be overcome. It shouldn't be hard to do. Uh, the but to report, return to what Richard said, the major problem is to deal with the social and economic issues which have created a situation in which the police, you know, no matter how well-intentioned they might be, are going to turn into a way to defend uh, the property rights of the wealthy and privileged from those who are smashed down by the socioeconomic system. That should never be tolerated. I think there, there are two challenges to democracy <clears throat> um, raised by the crazy proliferation of guns and also the situation of police forces with regard to that proliferation. Uh, I, I don't think, Professor Chomsky, that you've experienced the situation of being a faculty person in a university in a state which allows guns to be carried on campus and in the classroom. But at the University of Georgia, that, that is the case. And it's uh, just I think that's I am. I am in Arizona. Yeah. And the legislature is pressing very hard to allow the university to insist that the university allow guns on campus. Yeah. So far, they've blocked it. Uh, but the situation is ludicrous. A little while ago, I went to visit an old friend, close to 100 years old, living in an assisted living place in a suburb of Tucson, where I live, nice place. On the door, it says, no weapons allowed. I mean, a civilized society, this is unthinkable. Well, I think it's, it's become a challenge, really, to academic freedom and political freedom. Because how can one push the buttons of students, particularly if you're a philosophy professor, where no holds are barred, and uh, when you're under the threat of someone who's lethally armed. And likewise, within the political sphere, we now seem to arm, see armed militia coming out to confront peaceful demonstrators and menace them. And then there's the question of how do the police react to this? Because this is a question your first point raises. Donald Trump is going to call his armed militia out on the streets, very likely, if he loses the election. And a, a big question is, what will the police do? Um, here in Athens, we've seen the police the army, and the army ultimately. The, level of the, army. the army ultimately. We're in serious trouble. Yeah. And the questions are even raised, even opened at very high levels about yeah. whether the army should move in to maintain the democratic system. Just opening the question shows that we're in very serious trouble. Yeah. I think, yeah, I, and, I, and I also, I also want to um, 
to get to another audience question. Um, so uh, Chris Borg asks, uh, he says, um, I'd like to hear about what Professor Chomsky thinks will happen with Iran. And if we are looking at a potential repeat of the Iraq war um, with the continued and unfounded information that Iran has nuclear weapons. Well, that's a very interesting case. Uh, one of President Trump's achievements is to destroy every possible international uh, treaty that might uh, save or at least mitigate the da dangers that the world faces. So he's torn to shreds the arms control regime, nothing left of that. Uh, He's uh, pulled out of the Paris negotiations, uh, let's race on to destruction of the environment. And one of them is what you mentioned, pulled out of the joint agreement, the so-called Iran nuclear agreement. It was working very well. Even US intelligence agreed it's working very well. Well, let's destroy it. And let's instead impose very harsh sanctions on Iran, which almost guarantees that they're going to try to move forward to do something. Uh, the arrogance of the United States in doing this is almost indescribable. Uh, just a couple of days ago, Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State, uh, ordered the United Nations to reinstitute UN sanctions against Iran. Uh, shortly before the United States had brought it to the Security Council, no support. Okay, they don't support it. We'll just institute it unilaterally because we are the godfather. So we institute UN sanctions. Now, is there a way to deal with the alleged threat of Iranian nuclear weapons? Yes, in fact, there is. Uh, one way would just be to go back to the joint agreement. There's even a better way. Think about it for a minute. Why not institute a nuclear weapons free zone in the region? It's not hard. Everyone's in favor of it. The Arab states have been in favor of it for 20 years. Iran is strongly in favor of it. The non-aligned movement, the G77s, most of the world, strongly in favor of it. Now, Europe's in favor of it, can have intense ex inspections. We know that they work. They worked very well during the uh, joint uh, period of the joint agreement. What's blocking it? Us. It's blocked by the United States. The last person to block it comes up regularly in non-proliferation treaty meetings. The last person to block it was President Obama. Trump will almost surely block it if it comes up if he's in office. Why? Because the United States does not want Israeli nuclear weapons to be inspected. In fact, the United States does not even recognize their existence. Because if the United States recognizes their existence, which of course everybody knows, uh, that brings up questions of American law, Symington Amendment, which might mean that US aid to Israel has to be withdrawn. So in order to preserve Israel's nuclear facilities from inspection, the United States is willing to face the danger what it calls, it's what it, it itself calls the greatest threat in the world, Iranian nuclear weapons. I, I think that's a fraud, but if you believe them, they're saying, here's the greatest threat in the world. We want to maintain it because we don't want Israel's nuclear weapons uh, inspected. Does the population here have to accept that? I don't think so. Uh, the intensification of sanctions and threats against Iran is raising significantly the chances that some kind of military conflict will break out, which could be devastating. I mean, if there's, say, an attack on it, if, say, Israel bombs Iran or the United States bombs Iran, uh, what's Iran going to do? We know. First thing it's going to do is send its missiles to destroy the Saudi uh, oil system, which happens to be in northeast Saudi Arabia, right near Iran. They have the means to do it. They showed how a couple of months ago. Now that would ha that, that's essentially smashing up the core of the international oil system. What do you think the United States will do? 
go crazy or could have a nuclear war. All of this is imminent because of our refusal to take simple steps that can eliminate any alleged threat. So yes, that's important, one of many cases. I, th I, think, there's a, I think there's an underlying absurdity to much of our entire military policy since we emerged from World War II with a nuclear monopoly and subsequently spent trillions of dollars to achieve superiority in both nuclear and conventional weapons. And what that has done, it has led nations which feel threatened and are worried about regime change to have to have recourse to weapons of mass destruction to ensure their security, which would not be the case if this tremendous disproportion between the American uh, military complex and those of other nations existed. Now, now we can be destroyed within an hour by nuclear weapons, not just in Russia, but in an impoverished small country, North Korea. And you know, we in a sense drove it to become a nuclear power, just as we're driving Iran to be a nuclear power, which will drive Saudi Arabia and Turkey to become nuclear powers. I mean, we have to think instead of engaging in a massive reduction of, of, of nuclear weapons, both the arsenals of, of Russia and the United States, which far exceed those of other nations, instituting a cap on any further development and uh, demilitarized space. And I think we have to recognize that our security is intimately linked to how secure other nations feel. And by threatening them, we are putting ourselves in danger. Yeah, and, and this is another question. Um, how, um, just a second, this, this question is from John, John on Facebook. He says, um, what are your thoughts on the 2020 election and the peaceful transition of power? The peaceful transition? Yeah, yeah, like whether there will be a peaceful transition um, of power and like what the threat of that. Uh, who are you directing that to? Um, you can you can respond. Okay. Question. Well, the answer is we don't know. Uh, it's a, it's a very tense situation. When things get to the point that, as I mentioned before, some of the most respected top military officials retired in this case are concerned that the chief of staff may have to send the American army in to remove the president from office and to push aside his paramilitary forces. We're in bad trouble and we do not know the answer. Uh, just a day or two ago, President Trump virtually announced almost literally that he wants to ram through the Supreme Court nomination in order to ensure uh, that if it gets to the Supreme Court, he'll have the votes to stay in office, uh, whatever the electoral outcome. And there's been a, a lot of discussion of this in mainstream respectable places. There was a long article about it uh, yesterday in the Atlantic by Barton Gilman, a well-known correspondent, went through all the details about this. Uh, the constitution is not precise. Constitutions are based on good faith and assumption that uh, people will be more or less cooperative. Uh, the assumption of the Constitution, the founders of the Constitution, is that there'll be people like, say, Richard Nixon, and not the most delightful person in presidential history. But take a look at what he did. In 1960, uh, Nixon had very good reason to believe that he had won the election. There was a lot of uh, Democratic uh, Party machination in Democratic-run cities like Chicago, which probably swung the vote. He didn't challenge it. He preferred the welfare of the country to his personal ambition. Not today. Al Gore did the same 20 years ago. We're in a different world, very different world. We're in the world of petty third world military dictatorships. That's what President Trump and the Republican Party have created. It's not mince words. That's what it is. 
nothing like it in the history of parliamentary democracy. So the answer to your question is we don't know. It's up to people like you. Will people tolerate it if this happens? I think there are two kind of responses that we need to make because I think everything Professor Chomsky is saying is, is, is unfortunately true. <clears throat> I think we can't, we can expect Trump to not respect the constitution after the election any more than he has before the election. <clears throat> so I think, first of all, it's crucial that he be defeated as massively as possible in the polls. But secondly, that, that voters recognize that they're going to have to come out in the streets afterwards if he challenges the results of the election. And I think it's important before then that we try to get public assurances from as many figures in the military and in Congress and in state and local governments and, and also police departments that they are going to ensure that there's a peaceful trans transfer of power according to the results of the election and get them to begin stating as much publicly and castigating those who refuse to take a stand on this. And I think if that is done in, in a broad way, I think Trump may have more second thoughts than he currently will have. And um, this, this question comes from Ruby um, on Zoom. Uh, she says, um, what are your thoughts on the current immigration system, uh, considering the detention centers slash concentration camps at the Mexican-American borders, forcing involuntary hysterectomies on undocumented women uh, and how do you plan on fighting these corrupt, um, detestable actions? Uh, Noam, you can respond and then Richard can discuss like how, if he were to be elected, how he can um, address these issues. Well, the, the only favorable comment that one can make about the US uh, control and dealing with the border is that Europe is even worse. I mean, the response of the Western privileged countries to the flow of refugees is an utter atrocity. Uh, Pope Francis put it correctly. He said, it's not a refugee crisis. It's a moral crisis of the West. And that's what it is, both in Europe and the United States. Uh, refugees are fleeing, not because they want to live in Western countries, but because their own countries are unlivable uh, when uh, Europe has hundreds of years of history of destroying Africa, smashing and destroying Africa, too well known for me to review. Uh, the latest act was the French, British, American attack on Libya, destroyed the country, flight of refugees. People are fleeing from utterly intolerable conditions for which the West is largely responsible. So what do we do? Make sure they die in the Mediterranean. Keep them away from our holy shores. In the United States, people are fleeing from countries that we destroyed. Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador. These are countries that were devastated by American terror in the 1980s after a long history of the same kind of thing. Uh, take Honduras. It was a couple of years ago, it was the main center of refugees. I haven't seen the recent statistics. It's the place where the caravans were coming from. So why Honduras? 2009 in Honduras, after a long history of brutal rule by a, a vicious oligarchy who we installed and uh, supported, finally had a mildly reformist president, Mel Zelaya. Military threw him out, okay? Condemned all over the hemisphere, with one exception, Obama and Clinton. They said, it, they refused to say it's a military coup. Because if they did, we'd have to stop providing arms to the military junta. Uh, the military ran an election, denounced everywhere, almost. The United States praised it as a step towards democracy. Meanwhile, Honduras turned from one of the horror chambers of the world to the work to the homicide capital of the world. It was monstrous. People started fleeing. Now we stop them at the border. Uh, we force Mexico to keep them away from us. 
of the Reagan administration atrocities in the 1980s devastated the countries. Um, there are people fleeing right now from the Mayan highlands in Guatemala, where there was virtually genocide being carried out by General Rios Montt, who Reagan praised as a, a man totally dedicated to democracy, who's getting a bum rap from the human rights organizations. That's while the genocidal assault was going on. Uh, people are still fleeing. Uh, global warming, for which we are largely responsible, has hit these regions very hard. The extensive droughts, agricultural regions are being destroyed. We could do something to assist in overcoming that. Instead, what we do is force them away from our borders, make sure Mexican, Mexico stops them. If they manage to get here, don't offer them the legal requirements of appeal for asylum, throw them in concentration camps, uh, separate children from their parents, uh, don't give them medical aid so they die of COVID-19. Pope Francis was right. It's a moral crisis of the West. As I say, in Europe, it's even more grotesque. I, I want to second all of those um, ideas about how our policies have contributed to the immigration crisis, which is only going to get worse if we don't very decisively mitigate uh, climate change, which is going to drive hundreds of millions and, and billions of people from places where they're currently living because it will become in uninhabitable. Uh, we also have to add to it not only the repressive regimes that we have supported uh, south of the border, uh, but also our war on drugs, which has vastly enriched the cartels, as well as our gun policies, which have allowed them to arm themselves to the teeth, all of which helps drive people uh, fearful for their lives uh, to the north. But I think we, we should recognize a fundamental principle that anyone who is within our borders deserves to have all of their rights fulfilled with perhaps the exception of their uh, rights to participate in our government insofar as they're not citizens, but everything else they're entitled to. And that means that we should obey the universal and the international as well as domestic laws on asylum seekers. None of them should be kept across our border. They should be let in and offered free legal counsel. Their claims should be processed as quickly as possible not within seven years as it currently stands, but within six months. Uh, since we are largely responsible for not applying our immigration laws and for driving people across our borders uh, to, to escape destitution and, and, and death, uh, we need to provide legal status to pretty much everyone who's been here more than a year. Uh, and that, that includes not just DACA and um, those with protected status, but everyone else. And then of course we need to really uh, enlarge our quotas. Um, unlike Trump claiming that we are full, we're far from full. Uh, and obviously the history of our nation has been one where we've been able to be a significant power. And hopefully if we can perfect our democracy, a, a power for good, uh, we want to welcome immigration and, and continue uh, to take advantage of everything that involves. And I think no one should be put in prison for having come across illegally our borders, and certainly not for asylum seekers. Uh, we can let them go, we can track them in all sorts of ways. Uh, they should be offered legal aid and their cases should be expeditiously handled. And I think in that way we can, we can close down all the for-profit uh, immigration prisons, uh, as well as every other for-profit prison and, and, and treat these people with respect. And, and one more question. Um, this may be, seem simple, but it's you know very important. Like, why why should we vote? What is what's in it for us? <laughs> why should we? Why should we vote? Why should we vote? Well, one reason is: uh, Do you want your grandchildren to survive? The most critical problem we face, never before faced in human history, is whether human, organized human society will survive. Will it survive? And it's not far in the distance. Within the next 
decade or two, we have to decide whether to take the actions which offer some hope for preservation of organized human society, meaning blocking the constant inexorable destruction of the environment. It's pretty well understood what's going to happen across the board. To let things continue the way they are. Uh, by the end of the century, we may have moved to maybe three or four degrees centigrade, seven degrees Fahrenheit above pre-industrial levels. That's a cataclysm. Uh, organized human society can't even face that prospect. There are ways of dealing. They're feasible, they're within range, but you have to do them. Well, we have one political party, which is desperately trying to hold on to power, which says we should do something. We should make it worse. We should maximize the use of fossil fuels. We should eliminate regulations, which mitigate their effects and race towards catastrophe as quickly as possible. President Trump is in the leadership on this. It keeps almost every day something happens. Open up the last great nature reserve in the United States to fossil fuel drilling in Alaska. Uh, eliminate the regulations that protect the population and control the damage from the methane release and so on. Every day, something new. Uh, it's disastrous. Uh, the democratic program is not great. It leaves plenty to be desired, but at least it's open to pressure. That's important. Now, the Sunrise Movement, the Sanders Movement have moved Biden's program considerably to the progressive side of where it was, and it can go more. So we have a choice this November. Do we choose to ensure that our to make it almost certain that our grandchildren will not have a survivable world? Or do we move to try to protect not only us, but the world from impending disaster? There's never been a choice more important in entire human history. That's one reason to vote and give plenty more. I, I would agree that uh, this election, more than any other, in my lifetime, is one where one cannot afford to sit on the sidelines. And I think when it comes to the vote for national leadership, it's crucial that Trump be defeated, which requires a vote for Biden and Harris. Now, they, they were not my favorite candidates for the presidency, but there is a fundamental difference between what they stand for and what uh, Trump does. And they definitely are more amenable to all the kind of policies we've been discussing today. On the other hand, it's important for, for citizens to continue to push for the real solutions, um, which may involve going beyond what uh, Biden and Harris are currently standing for. And that requires that not only we support candidates in other races who are pushing a more progressive agenda, but also that after the election, we continue to use all our extra parliamentary peaceful means to try to, to change the spirit of the public and, and, and push what will hopefully be a new leadership to take decisive measures to a Green New Deal, to Medicare for all, to full employment and not just a living wage, but a fair wage, et cetera. And I think, you know, we can do things this November 3rd. Uh, despite all the difficulties we face in terms of campaign financing and the like, and all the obstacles we face in terms of the inequities in our, in our society and at home. But we still have that option left of voting. And who knows whether this will be our last opportunity to do so. And I think it, we, we need to take it and mobilize to take it strongly. But only affirm that very strongly. Um, we'll just what's we could squeeze in one more question um, from Jojo Levine on Facebook. Um, he says, uh, um, though I'm very supportive of Richard and his campaign, I'm very curious and skeptical about his conception of capitalism with a human face. In short, my question would be, what is Richard's vision for capitalism with a human face? And how would Professor Chomsky respond to this? 
in a nutshell, uh, what allows capitalism to have a human face is that it be subject to the public regulation and private interventions of universal unionization and employee co-determination uh, so that every enterprise finds itself required to broadly speaking do the right thing, which if it becomes a general prescription that they pay decent wages, that they have flexible hours to accommodate our, our family requirements, that they respect the environment, that they treat their employees fairly, that they provide proper goods and services and the like, uh, then we can save the souls of, of entrepreneurs who can remain competitive because these requirements will be imposed upon them all. Um, otherwise, the market becomes a problem. It becomes uh, something that is inhuman and puts all of our freedoms in jeopardy. And that also includes keeping private wealth out of politics and completely insulating the political sphere and, and the activity of campaigning, as well as running for office from all of those pressures that differences in wealth can impose. I think that's possible. And, and Professor, Chomsky, <laughs> Professor Chomsky, how would you um, respond to the idea that we should have um, capitalism with a human face as opposed to a kind of transition to a, an alternative um, uh, mode of production? Well, I think there ought to be radical changes, but we don't have that choice. The choice now is not between giving capitalism a more human face and overthrowing the system. That's a matter of time scale. There are things that we have to do tomorrow. We have to stop the race to destruction and through climate change and the threat of nuclear war. We have to deal with the horrendous refugee problem. We have to deal with the very serious problem of police violence and repression. There are all sorts of things. We have to deal with the assault, the neoliberal assault that has reversed the progress of the past, uh, of the early post-war period. All of that has to be done. All of that takes, say, the Green New Deal. I mean, my own view is that in the long term, the capitalist uh, imperatives are really inconsistent with the survival of the planet. But we don't have that choice now. We have the choice of adopting means that were within the framework of existing institutions that are feasible, available, and mitigating, overcoming the immediate horrendous crisis. That we can do. While we're doing it, we can think about moving on to a more just and free society. So Richard's point about putting workers on uh, direct boards of directors, management boards, that's a step forward. There's a further step forward, in my view, getting rid of bosses, having the workforce and the community run their own affairs. It's not a law of nature that some people have to give orders and others have to follow them. In fact, if you go back a uh, hundred years, say 150 years, uh, a slogan of the Republican Party under Abraham Lincoln was that uh, wage labor was different from slavery only in that it was temporary. Otherwise, it was a form of slavery. You're taking orders from somebody above you who controls you for most of your waking hours. That was considered an abomination. I think the Republican Party and Abraham Lincoln and industrial workers were correct. I think we can bear that in mind as we think about how a future society should be developed. But that's a matter of step-by-step -step movement. Can't snap your fingers and make it happen. That's not the choice we now face. The choice we face is and capitalism is a very pliable system, covers many different things. So let's move to make it less destructive, more humane, more 
uh, adaptive to people's needs and rights and justice. Meanwhile, we can be working on creating the kinds of institutions, the kinds of consciousness, which may lead the way to a more free, just, equitable society if we can overcome the huge crises that we now face. So I, you know, capitalism can take many different forms. You can have a worker self-managed enterprise. You can have a state enterprise, a municipal enterprise. To the extent that they interact with other enterprises in a market, uh, means that they're all subject to the same dynamic of competition. And to alleviate the effects of that requires public regulation as well as private intervention. And I think one has to recognize that that remains an imperative even if one changed the forms of ownership of enterprises. I discuss these things, by the way, at, at length in various books, The Just Economy and Rethinking Capital. But uh, we can get into that in, in another discussion, perhaps. Yeah. Um, and I'm trying to see, um, how do you, how would you, uh, this is from Lily um, on Zoom. Um, how would you compare the threats to the upcoming election with what happened in the Bush v. Gore election that was decided by the Supreme Court? And Pro Professor Chomsky, if you could answer that question. There has been nothing like what is at stake in this election in the entire hundreds of years of history of parliamentary democracy. Nothing like it. We have never seen a situation like this in any functioning parliamentary democracy. Furthermore, the stakes are far higher than they have been in the past. I mean, there were serious stakes in 2000, but nothing remotely comparable to today. We literally have the fate of the whole human experiment in our hands and not a lot of time to deal with it. We can deal with it. We don't have a lot of time. Another four years of what we've been through, just on climate alone, many other things on climate alone may bring us to tipping points, which are irreversible. At the very least, they'll make it far harder to deal with the very serious problems of controlling the, uh, and limiting the increasing growth of uh, uh, harm, desperate harm caused by the environmental crisis. And it's not just, you know, the fact that there are, uh, that half the far west is being uh, raging fires, that's one thing. Uh, when the uh, plains in Bangladesh uh, become inundated, we're going to have huge flood of desperate refugees of the kind the world has never thought of. When the water supply uh, dwindles in India and Pakistan, beyond the low level it already is with hundreds of millions lacking potable water. When it declines further, these two nuclear armed states are probably going to war about it. That may blow us all up. I mean, we're facing desperate problems. It was bad in 2000. It's just orders of magnitude different today, in fact, than anything we've ever faced. And I would second that. You know, the stakes are higher than in any election, at least in, I think, in all of our lifetimes. And we're dealing with a president who has no scruples, literally, and who is willing to both foster and call upon, I think, what we'd have to call a, a kind of fascist stormtrooper base that he will call into the streets, armed with combat weapons to disrupt the democratic process. Uh, Bush was not someone who was willing to do anything like that, but Trump is, and we have to prepare ourselves for that and do everything we can to prevent him from being able to, to take that step. And, and um, Richard, like, um, 
considering the um, um, recent passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the Republicans' efforts to um, push forward a, a new justice, um, uh, Chloe's wondering, you know, what is the uh, future of this? What will the future of the Supreme Court look like in the judiciary in general, and and whether Roe v. Wade and other important decisions are are at at risk? And 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 Professor Chomsky, you can feel free to respond after. Well, I, I think I think Democrats um, are being just as hypocritical as Mitch McConnell <clears throat> by saying that a decision should not be made because the Constitution does give the president and the Senate the power to make a uh, to introduce a candidate until the end of their terms. But I think there's a fundamental problem in the way we have the, the Supreme Court organized. It, it should have a certain kind of political neutrality where it should not be something that can serve the immediate interests of one regime and lock into the country for decades of submission to that particular, particular judicial view. And I think what we need to do is eliminate lifetime appointments. I think we should have a single term, maybe 10 years. It should be staggered so that no single administration can pack the court to its liking. And this should apply to all federal courts and lifetime uh, appointments have limited terms, single term, no reelection, so they can't pander to the voters and also have it staggered. Uh, and I think we need to enlarge all of the courts and we strike a, a balance to begin with. And I think that's what a, a victorious Democratic Party should immediately do when they come to power. And if I'm voted into the Senate, I will support that. And Professor Chomsky, what do you think about this the state of the Supreme Court and whether the future of the Supreme Court is at risk um, with RBG, RBG's passing? Well, there are significant changes that should be made in the judicial system, but I think we face a bigger threat in the political system. Uh, we're facing a constitutional crisis, quite apart from Trump. Uh, take a look at the Senate. It's one of the most undemocratic uh, institutions in the entire uh, parliamentary world. If a country like the, if the United States tried to join the European Union, it would be turned down by the European Court of Justice, not uh, just because of the way the Senate is set up. I mean, it's in the 18th century, the Constitution was a progressive document by the standards of the 18th century. By contemporary standards, it's not. Uh, the Senate, you have, uh, say, the state of Wyoming with about 600,000 people has two senators. The state of California with 40 million people has two senators. Uh, the, this is just one part of a disparity in political power between the rural, uh, conservative, white, Christian, uh, America, religious with, uh, with enormous political power way beyond its, its numbers uh, as compared with the much diverse, uh, uh, more diverse, uh, complex uh, uh, urban centers that are growing. Uh, that's an impossible situation. And unfortunately, you can't change it by constitutional amendment uh, because the small states have the power to block a constitutional amendment. That's a, uh, that's a system which may have had its own reasons in the 18th century, but utterly intolerable today. And unless we find some, this also affects the electoral college, uh, the state legislatures, given the way districts are apportioned and so on. So it's a very broad problem across the whole society, which somehow or other we have to find ways of dealing with. That's way beyond the sledgehammer that Trump has brought, which is devastating the uh, democratic system as it exists with all its flaws. These are serious long-term problems. And P Professor Chomsky, we want to be respectful of your time. And so we're going to now begin just like a closing statement from each of you guys about um, 
just the, the future of democracy in America, like the views and, and just a, a brief closing statement about just the general ideas that were discussed. So Professor Chomsky, if you could uh, give a closing statement, please. Thank you. Well, I'll only repeat what both of us have said, it can't be said too often, that within a few weeks, we're facing a crucial decision. The decision will have an enormous effect on not only whether democratic forms can survive, but whether human life can survive in any organized form. If we can get over that barrier, there are major problems to be dealt with. We have the means to do it. It's not easy. Their entrenched interests will have to be overcome, but it's something that can be addressed on to the level of moving towards, in my view, a very different form of society. Those are the choices we face. I would agree that uh, the very existence of our democracy hinges upon certain international imperatives that every person on this planet faces, namely mitigating in as quick and broad a way as possible our accelerating climate crisis. We also have to deal with the threat of nuclear weapons. Uh, domestically, and I think this applies also to any nation that aspires to be democratic, we have to eliminate all those blockages of opportunity that pertain to the household and society uh, that also stand in the way of equal participation in the political domain. And in terms of the United States, we have to remedy those problems within our very own democratic system that are, are against popular rule. We have to get rid of the um, electoral college. We need to change the character of the Senate by either reducing it to a House of Lords or have weighted voting to remedy that disparity in, uh, in per person uh, role and power in the Senate. Uh, we need to end partisan gerrymandering. We need to have radical campaign finance reform so that all candidates can get a fair hearing and have their message known to the public. We need to ensure that employees have a chance to actually run for office by receiving replacement income during a campaign and all benefits and, and guaranteed return to work if they lose. I think these are sort of basic things that we need to attend to if we make it through this election. But again, this election is, is a moment of decision. So I hope all of us take it seriously as we, as we really need to. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Richard and Professor Chomsky for your time. Um, and thanks everyone for, for uh, the live questions. Um, it really helped us, um, you know, uh, engage in a lively discussion and conversation. Thank you both and thank you everyone for uh, joining us. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank Professor you. Thank you.